everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Jessica. I'm so glad you're all here tonight and I hope you can hear me all right. We are going to spend about the next hour or so looking at some incredible images and thinking about the role of women in the world and in the arts. And it seems particularly timely given um, some of the news that has happened over the, the past weekend or so. So um, so thank you again for joining us. I, um, I built in several pauses throughout the program and I'll stop for maybe just one or two of them to see if anybody has any burning questions at that point, but I, I welcome your questions at the end of the program as well or any comments you might have. So before we dive into the program, I wanted to very quickly talk about the image that I have up here on the screen, because I think it's one that most people are pretty familiar with. And we think of it as sort of like a classic image of an empowered woman. It's Rosie the Riveter, right, from uh, 1943. This is not Rockwell's Rosie. This is um, J. Howard Milner's Rosie. So another male artist depicting an empowered woman. Um, interesting sort of background on this is that this is considered a really problematic image because Here's the artist trying to kind of lure women to the workforce to support the war effort um, in the 1940s. But women were making much less than men in these roles. And they were, of course, still considered or still um, expected to fulfill all of the domestic <laughs> work that they typically did at homes, too. So an image like this even though we look at it today and she's beautiful and strong, it was an image that was really sort of asking women to take on even more than they already do. So um, I have to say, I still love her though. And I, I always think this is what I'm going to be for Halloween and then I forget that. <laughs> so let's dive in looking at images of women and the history of art. Let me just advance the slide. Oh no, what did I just do here? Let's see. Here we go. All right. So thinking about the history of the way women have been depicted in art in very, very broad general terms here, um, this comparison sort of shows that throughout the history of art, you have men depicted as um, as figures of historical significance and more, more importantly, figures of action. We have Napoleon Bonaparte on the left, uh, painted by Jacques-Louis David. He's crossing the Alps. He's up on a rearing horse. Everything's flying, you know, the cape and the hair is flying in the breeze. His arm is raised. He's empowered and he's powerful. And then on the right, we have this tradition of painting women um, uh, sort of lost in contemplation or reading a book or lounging on a couch, uh, reading a love letter. The image on the right is painted by the New England artist Edmund Tarbell back in 1913, and it's just called Reverie. And so we see women oftentimes being painted at best um, in this sort of idle role, uh, and they certainly don't um, don't get the kind of sort of action historical significance that we see um, that is sort of reserved for, uh, for male subjects. So moving on and sort of building on this idea, <clears throat> this difference in the way that men and women have traditionally been depicted in the arts really stems from their role and is based in their role in society at large and specifically in the art world. So in the art world, we see men as active creators for centuries and women sort of playing this kind of passive role. I love this painting by the French artist Jerome and it's just called Working in Marble. It's from 1890. And so we see, you know, an artist here actively creating something and his female subject here, the, or his model in this case, um, is as still <laughs> as that marble uh, reproduction of her just beyond her. So again, the men are creators, they're, they're doing something um, of significance and, and, and women are, are in such passive roles. This is, a, generally speaking, just a, a broad sort of brushstroke uh, um, in describing the history, but for the most part, it, it holds true. So thinking about what we're, we're, uh, we'll be looking at tonight and this idea of being a fierce female. So let's define it. Uh, my working definition here is that fierce females are women who created art that defied expectations and pushed beyond the boundaries of what was considered appropriate, acceptable, or desirable for their time. And 
You've got to love this image on the screen here. This is by an Italian artist named um, Elisabetta Siriani, and it was painted in 1659. It's a depiction of Timoclea killing her rapist. So there's this whole backstory to this, to, to this painting, but what this female artist is showing us is this sort of um, violent scene without any context. We just see this woman who is literally just dumping this man into a well, his, his body sort of in this awkward pinwheel, and she is looking as fierce as ever. So we don't know much about this, this female artist because she only lived to the age of 27. But what we do know is that during her short life, she championed other female painters and female subjects, and she even opened a painting school at where she trained other women. So obviously, she was someone who was really sort of oriented towards um, championing the, the lives of, of women and, um, and, and, and promoting stories about women. So um, another sort of fierce female for us to consider is this one here. And the image that we're looking at is a film still from a film that's in a number of museum collections. Um, I pulled this image from the New Museum in New York City. And the artist here, who's also the subject, is a Swiss artist named uh, Pipilotti Rist. So this is from 1997. And the, the video, the film, is called Ever is Overall. And what the artist is doing in this, in this film is exactly what we see here. She's walking down the street in this beautiful sort of diaphanous blue gown, bright red shoes. Bright red shoes always get attention, right? And she is smashing the windows of cars, <laughs> cars that don't belong to her, of course. Um, so generally speaking, this, a film like this was, was seen as being anti-authoritarian, but it was an expression of freedom too against the norms that we sort of ascribe to feminine behavior. So this was considered a really sort of wild and barrier breaking for the time. And it's sort of not surprising or kind of impressive that a pop icon like Beyonce would appropriate an image like this for a music video that she um, that she created back in 2016. The, the song was called Hold Up. And so it could just look like a random act of violence, but she was really quoting the history of art and trying to say that she is a strong sort of anti-authoritarian woman. And Beyonce in particular is somebody who uh, really loves this word fierce. Most people kind of associate the word fierce with Beyonce today. Um, and she also loves the other F word, which is feminist. She actually had this word light up in giant letters behind her on stage at a performance recently. So Beyonce is somebody who's really sort of playing with this idea of, of what it means to be fierce, what it means to um, really sort of own your femininity. And uh, fascinatingly, she's always looking back at the history of art and the history of images and utilizing it sort of to her benefit. But tonight is not just about Beyonce. <laughs> tonight is about the history of art. So let me give you an overview of everything that we're going to cover here, and it is a lot. So I'll be talking fast and I will be showing you a lot of images, but they're all fantastic. So what we're going to do first is do a very, very brief overview of women in art, just to give you a sense of sort of um, some of the incredible triumphs that have been there that most people don't know about, and then some of the barriers too. And then we're going to look at this incredible list of female artists. And of course, we can't cover everything about them. Um, there's fascinating elements of religion and politics uh, and uh, all these other things related to these artists. But we're going to sort of look at what, made, what makes them or made them fierce. And then we'll finish up by sort of thinking about the road ahead for female artists. This gorgeous image on the screen right now is painted by a French artist named La Ville Guillard. Maybe you've actually seen this image in person because it's at the Metropolitan Museum. It's sort of unforgettable because it's seven feet high. And you know, it depicts it's a self-portrait of a female artist sitting at a canvas with two female students behind her. And I'm a sucker for a beautiful dress, and that is one gorgeous dress she's got on. I can't believe that she would actually paint in it. Um, but she was like 
Siriani, who we just saw before, another female artist who sort of championed the education of other female artists. And she was actually the first French artist to receive permission um, to allow her female students to study at the Louvre. So she was sort of a barrier breaker too. All right, so let's get started thinking about women artists through the ages. We're going to start way back, <laughs> and I promised you we're going to move quickly. So what we're looking at here is a prehistoric cave painting. This is Chauvy Cave in France, which dates to about 30,000 BC. And I love this cave painting in particular. Um, the detail that I love here, let's see if I can pull up my mouse, yes. The detail that I love is the series of profiles of what I think are horses here. They're just, they're painted so beautifully beautifully and layered over each other so beautifully. And, um, and this is a cave that some of you might have seen if you've ever seen the Werner Herzog movie, Cave of Forgotten Dreams from a few years back. He covers this beautifully. So most of these prehistoric caves are covered in depictions of animals. You can probably just make out more um, horse-like figures here with tiny little legs and smaller heads here. And for a long time, um, the history of art has taught that, that these cave paintings were probably ceremonial. Maybe they had something to do with, you know, training young men to hunt. You'll notice that there are these red dots all over the animals. Maybe they were like doing target practice there. You'll also notice the handprints um, throughout this cave and many, many others. And I, I love this image over here on the left because this was actually in my survey art history textbook when I was in college. And what we see here is a modern male artist complete with beret who's demonstrating how prehistoric man would have um, actually spit pigment out at the wall to create that handprint there. And the handprint, of course, is the great signifier of, you know, I made this, I was here. It's just like, you know, modern day graffiti, like Jane was here. Um, but what we know now is that these cave, these prehistoric caves that are filled with these handprints, this is the cave of hands actually in Argentina, that about three quarters of these hands have been proven by archeologists to be female hands. So it is most likely that these gorgeous cave paintings that we've been associating to prehistoric man for so long were probably painted by women. And in so many ways, it sort of, it just makes sense when I look at it too. So it's, um, it's a real sort of revision and a real um, uh, new understanding about um, or potential for new understanding about how and why those cave paintings were created. So moving ahead really quickly up to classical antiquity, what we're looking at here are two gorgeous ancient Greek vases. And these vases are, are well known. They're in uh, many major museum collections because they have these uh, incredible paintings that tell us so much about life in ancient Greece and, um, and priorities in ancient Greece. So the two images that I have here are both from the fifth century. And this is uh, the one on the left is done by the Berlin painter. The one on the right is done by the carpenter painter. And I bring in these two examples because what we're looking at here on the left is a battle scene with the Amazon. So you can see all sorts of armor and spears and shields and even a fallen soldier here. And then the image on the right, we're looking down into a vase. And what we're seeing here is a romantic scene um, a homoerotic scene between teacher and student. And these two subjects tend to be the, um, the major subjects in ancient Greece, Greek vase painting, homoeroticism and war. <laughs> so for many years, <laughs> for about 2000 years or so, we've just assumed that most of these paintings were done by male artists. And there wasn't really any history to tell us any different. But what we do know is that this incredible um, a gigantic mosaic that was discovered in Pompeii when Pompeii was being excavated. This is um, known as the Alexander mosaic. It dates to about um, the third century, I believe. Uh, what we're looking at here was actually, and, and I should, I have to underscore that this is a huge and significant mosaic. It's about 17 feet long. Um, and we see uh, Alexander the Great over here uh, and his uh, rival, his enemy, Darius the Third, 
over here. And so it's this incredible battle scene. And what what history sort of tells us here, this first sort of glimpse at the history now, is that this incredible scene was actually inspired by a vase painting uh, that was done by a woman named Helen of Egypt. So now we know that um, one of the, the most significant works coming out of classical antiquity was inspired by the work of a woman and that there were female um, vase painters in, in ancient Greece. So they were making it, it, amazing contributions. I just love this detail here of the mosaic too. I love the big eye of, of Alexander here staring down his opponent, the detail of his armor, the shading, it's really just amazing. Zooming ahead, <laughs> another uh, thousand years or so. We're up in um, medieval times, right around the year 1000. And so now I want us to, to consider the work of, um, or, or the illuminated manuscripts that were being produced around this time. And again, we assume that most of the people who were illustrating these manuscripts and even uh, writing the text for these manuscripts were probably male because oftentimes they included their own self-portraits in these works. So um, the image on the left is one uh, sort of a classic example from, from the history of art. This is the Edwin Salter and, and he, the, there's an inscription in that book that, that describes him as being the prince of scribes. And so uh, we oftentimes think of monks as, as uh, being involved in this work which would be really laborious and really detail oriented. So it makes sense that people who sort of dedicate their lives to the church and are sort of cloistered away from society would dedicate themselves to this. Well, we do have this incredible example of a nun named Gouda who was a, a, a manuscript illuminator. And so what we're looking at here is her self-portrait. So you can see her name Gouda, and then the text here actually says, Gouda, a sinner, wrote and painted this book. And this dates to about 1290. And what we're looking at is one of the very first women in Western civilization to create a signed self-portrait. That's pretty mind blowing, right? And incredibly, we know that Gouda is not the only one to do this. What we're looking at here is another gift from the field of archeology. span We're looking at the teeth and the jaw of a nun whose body was found, exhumed, um, I think just last year. And this, nun's this nun was alive about 900 years ago. I think she was found in Germany, I want to say, yes. Um, and you'll notice right here, there's this chunk of aquamarine. Uh, it's, it's a mineral here. It's actually um, lapis lazuli, which would have been imported from 4,000 miles away from Afghanistan to Europe uh, to create the pigment of, of like this deep, rich blue, like what I'm wearing tonight. So the reason why you would find lapis lazuli in someone's teeth is because they were a painter and they might have licked their brush. So it's embedded in this nun's jaw because she was an artist, which is kind of amazing. We don't really have many historical records to tell us who they are, but we're finding this information that's you know shedding light on the role of women as artists. And then zooming ahead, now we're in the 19th century, and I just wanted to show you um, a couple of works by this incredible artist, Edmonia Lewis. And she was an American artist. She was born in um, 1844. She was a free black American, um, but that's not to say she didn't face <laughs> significant hardships as a young black woman. She lost her parents when she was very young, um, but she did have, uh, a, a natural talent in, in, in sculpting that uh, received, you know, she received some schooling and she was able to create these incredible sculptural busts like the one that you see on the right. And the figure here is actually John Brown, the famous abolitionist. She would sell these sculptural busts and eventually um, save up enough money to go to Rome and get formal training in sculpture, which is like the place that you had to go if you were a sculptor at the time. So Edmonia Lewis entered into um, the 1876 uh, Philadelphia Exhibition, uh, uh, the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, this uh, monumental sculpture 
of Cleopatra, who's in sort of the throes of death right now. And Edmonia Lewis was only 32 years old when she carved this. And this is, a, a, the sculpture itself is over 3,000 pounds. Just imagining taking on something like this is really incredible to me. So Cleopatra was sort of a favorite subject matter because um, it was sort of a highbrow kind of literary kind of subject matter. And, um, and, and it was the opportunity to, to paint or carve somebody who was really beautiful. But this moment here where she has already been bitten by the asp, you know, she's not contemplating her death, she's dying here. This was considered by some critics to be really sort of ghastly or repellent. And of course, for that reason, people couldn't take their eyes off of it at the exhibition. And, um, and she received a great deal of praise for this sculpture. But for some reason, um, women artists and their reputations tend to be the sort of fleeting thing in the history of art. So this sculpture in particular, after it debuted, it was essentially all but lost. Listen to this, I want to make sure I get this right. It ended up at a Chicago saloon, and then it marked a horse's grave at a suburban racetrack, and then it eventually appeared at a salvage yard in the 1980s. Now, guess where it is? At the Smithsonian Museum of Art. So here's Edmonia, Edmonia Lewis back in the um, 1870s, having this incredible career, producing incredible work, but no, you know, but essentially is lost to history so quickly. So we're going to finish up this history very quickly, <laughs> this history of women in art. And now we're up in, in the 1970s. And what we're looking at here is a painting by the female artist Alice Neal. And her subject is the art historian Linda Nochlin and her daughter Daisy. This was painted in um, 1973. And Linda Nochlin, I can't state her importance enough. She's really the foundation of the entire program tonight because she wrote a seminal essay called Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? She wrote that in 1971. And so Linda Nochlin gives us a couple of different, different reasons. First is there's a lack of training or a lack of access to training, which creates a lack of opportunities. And then the next one, and I have to catch myself in this one all the time still, is that we are very comfortable with the myth of male genius. We're very quick to call people like Michelangelo a genius, Picasso a genius, but we don't do the same thing when we're talking about female artists or, or women in, in, in other fields even. We might all love the work of Georgia O'Keeffe, but rarely do we refer to her as the genius. So, um, so just to hammer that home, you see a, an, an image from the 1700s by, uh, by Matthew Pratt. This is in the, the collection of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is called the American School. And of course, it's completely lacking in women. <laughs> this was something that only young men were doing. And then in the 19th century, you have uh, the premier school, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. It was where you would go if you wanted to um, study to be an artist. And so, of course, you have this issue of having, um, of studying for anatomy from nude models. And this was considered a really inappropriate thing for women to do. So very few women were receiving the kind of training, the, the you know, the most excellent training that men had access to. So just to round out this, this very brief history of, of women in art, I love this poster. It's like embedded in my brain. Um, it's created by an activist group called the Guerrilla Girls, and they're sort of an anonymous collective. They get together, they do performances, they create uh, posters like what you see here, but they're always wearing these gorilla masks. <laughs> and the question here, do you have to be nude to get into the Metropolitan Museum? Less than 5% of the artists in the modern art sections are women, but 85% of the dudes are female. So um, the gorilla girls, as you can see here at the bottom, they consider themselves the conscience of the art world, asking very important questions like this. So we're about to shift gears and then start looking at some of the, uh, these fierce female artists. But before we do that, does anybody have any burning questions at this point or burning comments that they'd like to share? You can feel free to mute or unmute yourself if you do. If not, we will keep going. Okay. 
So we're going to move through these artists quickly and in chronological order. And I'm really going to try and focus on what makes them fierce. So the first artist we're looking at here is the Italian artist Artemisia Gentileschi. She's a Baroque artist and just her self-portrait that you see here on the, on the right. Uh, this dates to 1639, by the way. Just her self-portrait is an opportunity to talk about her fierceness because what she's doing here is depicting herself as the very allegory of painting. And the, uh, an allegory, if you're not familiar with this, this art historical term, essentially refers to um, the female embodiment of a higher ideal. So you might have an allegory of war, an allegory of peace, an allegory of plenty, that sort of thing. But it was, it was almost always, actually always, a female body that would represent this, this ideal. So here she is, the very embodiment of painting. And, um, and, and this would have been very clear to her contemporary audience because she has dark sort of tousled hair. She's wearing this long chain. And at the bottom, there's, uh, there's a face, uh, a sort of a mask that was um, associated with the allegory of painting. And of course, she's depicting herself in the act of painting. I love how she uses the edge of the canvas here to suggest the surface of the canvas that she is painting. So already she's doing some pretty interesting things. So Artemisia Gentileschi, her work um, features very prominently uh, female protagonists in really interesting ways. And I think it's worth mentioning that, that Artemisia Gentileschi received training and became a prominent artist because her father was a prominent artist. And this is what we'll see pretty much up, up until the, the 19th century. So what we're looking at here is one of her most famous paintings called Susanna and the Elders, which was painted in 1610. And I think it's worth comparing it to the painting of the same subject that her father did. So over here is her father, over here is Artemisia Gentileschi. And I, there's all sorts of interesting comparisons that you can make here. But essentially the story that is being depicted in both of these images is the story of a beautiful young woman who has been spied upon as she is bathing. And these two sort of lecherous older men are threatening her um, in this moment um, after they've spied on her and, and saying that they're, you know, basically going to do horrible things to her. Um, so, so the way her father has depicted this scene, I give him credit because he has not created this completely idealized female nude. She's got this sort of fleshy body here, but she is being sort of assaulted in this very moment. And, and she looks as though she's just kind of rolling her eyes, that it's just a mild annoyance. Um, whereas Artemisia Gentileschi, as a female artist, is showing this moment where these older men are sort of whispering these horrible things that they're planning on doing. And she has taken this female body and sort of twisted it and, and, um, and contorted it and shows this pained expression, this really realistic pained expression on, on her subject's face here. So this becomes um, the, sort of, um, these, these female protagonists become what, what Artemisia Gentileschi is most well known for. And brace yourself because she is known for <laughs> really sort of violent imagery. And this goes hand in hand with, um, with, the, with the dominant style at the time. This Baroque painting oftentimes has, you know, this black background, bloody imagery, these sort of spotlit, spotlit characters in the, in the foreground. So what we're looking at here is a depiction of Judith slaying Holofernes. This dates to 1614. A lot has been written about this work in particular because um, our, the artist, Artemisia Gentileschi, um, had actually been been raped herself and had been you know a part of a, a long extended uh, trial against her rapist where she was actually physically tortured with thumb screws to see if, if she was telling the truth so a lot of art historians for many years put a lot of weight on that personal 
sort of life experience that she had and, and ascribed that to the reason that she was creating images like this. But she was really good at creating images like this, even though the scene looks bloody and chaotic. I'm going to sort of walk you through it quickly so that you can see it's actually really well thought out and balanced and incredible. So very briefly, the story that's being depicted here is the story of uh, Judith and Holofernes. It's from, it's a biblical story from the book of Judith. And it's essentially um, this idea of, of Holofernes is, is oppressing Judith's people. So she sort of sneaks into his tent, seduces him, and when he falls asleep, she beheads him. So she's like the savior of her people. And, and um, Artemisia Gentileschi has given us the bloodiest moment of their encounter. But it is quite balanced. As Judith's arms come in at this diagonal on the right, Holofernes' legs go off at, um, at the same diagonal. So you get this beautiful V coming through right into the picture. Uh, and then his arm sort of shoots up towards her maidservant, who's pressing down, sort of, so we have these equal opposite reactions here, um, and she's pressing down on the sword, um, and the sword continues past his head, and even sort of the drips of blood go right down the center of this picture. So uh, it's all this forcefulness here, but it's all very sort of staged and choreographed and, and, and sort of beautiful. Just to compare this to the work of a male artist from the same time, this is the work of Caravaggio on the left um, from just a few years earlier. You can see that he doesn't quite have, or he wasn't as concerned with creating an image that was as balanced. There's, they both have this interest in the gore, but not necessarily the same incredible composition. And then just to sort of hit home <laughs> this idea that Artemisia Gentileschi was really interested in female protagonists. This is another biblical story that she painted of Jael and Sisera from 1620, where again, um, it's sort of a, a, a female uh, heroine who is uh, slaying someone who's an oppressor, in this case with a tent uh, stake. <laughs> so there's always a, some uh, remarkable violence here, but but we're seeing women as um, heroes. So thinking back to, you know, Napoleon and the Alps, this is a really strange and unusual way to depict a woman. And so that's why Artemisia Gentileschi, Gentileschi is definitely a fierce female. So we're going to switch gears and look, move on up into the 19th century and look at the work of Rosa Bonheur. And I love this painting of her. This is a portrait by a male artist named um, Edouard Louis Dubuffy. And the portrait was done in 1857. And it tells us what really what we need to know about Rosa Bonheur. And that is she was an artist that painted animals. So the French would refer to her as an, let's see if I don't <laughs> butcher the pronunciation, an animalier. Uh, so here she is, her arm kind of wrapped around this bull with her paintbrush and her, um, and her notebook in her other hand. So um, Rosa Bonheur was thought to be, generally accepted to be, the most famous female artist in France for the entire 19th century. And, um, and so she was very popular, she had a great deal of fame, and she came, and she, like Artemisia Gentile, she came from a family of artists. She received training from her father. And for the most part, she created works like the ones that you see here, these kind of realistic but very sentimental uh, portraits of animals. This is what she specialized in. We have the white horse on the left from 1866, beautifully painted, and then um, a hound from 1856 um, that's in the collection of the Met. So these were, um, these were, you know, works that gentlemen would like to sort of collect and sometimes, you know, they'd have their hounds painted, uh, that sort of thing. But Rosa Bonheur really made a name for herself with this monumental painting called The Horse Fair that dates to 1855. It's huge. It's roughly eight feet by 16 feet long. It's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so you have these probably over life-sized horses, you know, in various stages of activity. Some of them are rearing up. Some of them are, you know, look like they're charging forward. So this would have been like a market scene that would take place in Paris. And um, this is by far Bunner's best known work. Uh, she was, um, 
she would go to this fair for about a year and a half and sketch what she saw. And she actually had to dress as a man to discourage um, attention from, from people. <laughs> so she, um, she received a great deal of praise for, for this work. She was celebrated for this work. It was compared to the Parthenon frieze, the way the animals were sort of overlapping and so energized. And, um, and Rosa Bonheur, actually received the French Medal of the French Legion of Honor Medal for um, for her contributions to the art world. You can see that she's actually wearing it in the photograph on the right. But she lived, she she chose and sort of had to live this kind of unconventional lifestyle be, um, to create the works that she was creating. So she was visiting abattoirs, she was visiting veterinary schools, she was dissecting animals, and she actually had to receive permission from the French government in order to wear pants and move about these spaces more easily. She smoked, she hunted, she was openly gay, and she once told a male friend, I love this, she said, if you only knew how little I care for your sex, you wouldn't get such queer ideas in your head. The fact is, in the way of males, I only care for the bulls that I paint. <laughs> so you can tell she was she was fierce in and of her own right. She was definitely sort of living outside of the norm, creating works that were outside of the norm. Um, so she was sort of the living embodiment of fierceness for the time. And then you have someone like Mary Cassatt. I actually got into a debate with someone um, a couple months ago. Uh, there was a, a library that that wanted uh, that was interested in this program, but they did not. I, the librarian I was talking to did not feel that Mary Cassatt qualified as fierce. <laughs> but I have my little argument for you tonight in terms of as in terms of why she she should be considered fierce. So she was an American artist. She lived in 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 France. She was living in Paris, and and she was um, rubbing elbows with all of the major French Impressionist painters like Monet and Manet and Degas. So she was considered among the top three female Impressionists. There really weren't that many of them. So you have Mary Cassatt's self-portrait on the left, which dates to 1878. You have uh, Marie Brackmann's self-portrait from 1870 in the middle. And then the other probably best known female Impressionist painter was um, Berthe Marisot, and this is a painting of her by Edward Manet from 1872. So these were our leading female Impressionists, and let me give you a sense in terms of what their work looked like. Almost exclusively domestic scenes, and these are beautiful pictures in and of their own right, and you know, it's important to obviously to paint these, these sorts of scenes and to elevate the subject matter. Um, but we know that uh, Mary Cassatt was friends with these, with these male painters. And in particular, she was friends with um, Edgar Degas, who we see here on the right in his self-portrait from 1863. And Edgar Degas was creating really sort of fascinating, stimulating work because he was going out at night and going to the cafe concerts and painting um, the, the women, in, the performers in these kind of raunchy shows. I love the song of the dog and the way this woman's standing and you can just imagine what she's singing about <laughs> in this image on the left. And then the image on the right is called the women at the cafe terrace. Um, in the evening from 1877. These are both works by Degas and it shows the kind of, um, not necessarily the seedy under, but underbelly of Paris, but basically, but you know, a, a little bit. It's like going out to the nightclubs and seeing the crowds, and in some cases, seeing the ladies of the evening. So Mary Cassatt's friends with Degas, but she can't paint this sort of thing. It would be completely inappropriate for a woman of her social standing to go out to these spaces. So we know that Mary Cassatt was sort of relegated to these kind of domestic paintings where we see this, this beauty, we see a connection between mother and child, but we also see a sort of a sense of boredom. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> Maybe a sense of constraint. Um, these two images of, of women having tea, I really see the sense of, of lives constrained by social expectations. Uh, we don't necessarily see joy. We don't necessarily see freedom in these pictures. 
But Mary Cassatt has a brief period in her career, a brief series, where she paints images of women going to the Paris Opera. And these images are so different from these kind of domestic mother-child scenes that she paints. So this is a, a painting that's called Woman in a Pearl Necklace from 1876, 79, sorry, on the left. Um, this is actually a portrait of her sister Lydia. And then on the right, just in case you've never been inside the Paris Opera, put it on your bucket list now if you haven't. This is what the interior of the Paris Opera looks like from the stage. So it's essentially like a horseshoe. Um, shaped theater with multiple levels of theater boxes. And of course, if you had a seat in those theater boxes, you'd spend plenty of time looking around at the other people in these theater boxes and then looking down on the crowd, just like when you go to the theater today. It's about, you know, wearing your best outfit and kind of checking everybody else out. So that's what you see Lydia doing here. It's a strange picture because she's probably sitting in front of a mirror and we're probably seeing the reflection of the theater boxes that she is looking at. But interestingly enough, she does not seem to be wearing a pearl necklace in um, what I think is her reflection over here. So in these scenes, Mary Cassatt gives women the power of the gaze. And if you're interested in art history, you know that the gaze is typically ascribed to men and the gaze is this powerful thing that turns uh, your subject into an object. Um, and I always just think of the power of the gaze in really simple terms, think of yourself carrying a tray in a cafeteria and you drop the tray and everything clatters to the ground, everybody looks at you. And just the act of looking can be so powerful. It can make you feel horrible and it can empower um, other people who, who are engaged in just the act of looking. So here on the left, we see uh, these two young women who are up high in those opera boxes, looking down with their opera glasses. And they almost look like they're sharing a secret, right? You can almost imagine that they're talking about maybe the show, but maybe other people. That one's called In the Box from 1879. And then the image on the right is one of Mary Cassatt's best paintings. It's called At the Opera, 1878. It's in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts. And we have what looks like a, a rather serious woman who looks like she's really engaged with the show that she's attending. She doesn't seem frivolous in any way. She's wearing a serious black dress. She's looking straight out. Um, you can imagine that she's focused on the show, but she might be looking at other people. And then Mary Cassatt gives us this delightful detail that this banister that she's leaning on circles all the way back to this male character in the background who also has opera glasses and who is leaning over checking out the very woman who is you know so empowered by her by by this gaze and the opera glasses in her hands so uh, going to the opera of course is all about seeing and being seen. That's what she's emphasizing here, but she's giving women the power to do that. And in the history of art, typically it's the men <laughs> that have been given that power. This is the classic comparison from like Art History 101, Renoir's uh, um, At the Loge or La Loge from 1874, just a few years before Mary Cassatt. You have this beautiful woman, gorgeous dress, jewelry, flowers. Um, she looks like a China doll. And she is, um, she's presented without sort of any agency. And of course her date is back here very clearly checking out other people. <laughs> so Mary Cassatt gives us the women that can do that. So for that reason, she is fierce or at least had dabbled in fierceness, right? So we're gonna move into the 20th century and I'm going to try to talk just even a little bit faster. We talked to, I mentioned Georgia O'Keeffe before, before. She's a household name, of course, and, um, and her career really took off um, in the 19 teens and the 1920s once she met her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. And he had seen these kind of early studies that she had produced of flowers and of these sort of modernist shapes. And, um, and they sort of worked together um, and sort of inspiring each other. And then by the 19, um, 20s, she's producing these incredibly modernist images of flowers. We take these for granted today, but nothing like this had ever really been painted before 
Georgia O'Keeffe. And of course, throughout the history of art, female artists have been sort of, um, have taken up the subject of flowers, probably more so than men. Um, and maybe even in sort of like a disdainful way, like, oh, she's just a flower painter. Um, the comparison here is um, with a, a Dutch Baroque painting by Rachel Roish, it probably dates to about say 1700. And traditionally, it, anybody, male, female, painting a flower painting, probably paint a bouquet, probably paint things in bloom. Uh, the, the Dutch were known for painting things in sort of uh, uh, the whole spectrum from, from first blossom to, to decay, and including all sorts of, you know, interesting details of bugs and that sort of thing. Uh, but it's, it was revolutionary to depict a flower the way that Mary Cassatt did, in that you were going inside of it. it. It looks like it's being lit up by stage lights, and she's paying attention to every single petal and fold, and, and it's really just remarkable and stunning. So Mary Cassatt, the household name today, the, the, in the image I, that I have up here now is called Gray Line with um, black, blue, and yellow from 1923. Uh, it was actually her husband who was this kind of remarkable promoter of artists. He was the one that started pushing the story that these were um, depictions of female anatomy. And that's what really helped to make Georgia O'Keeffe famous. She denied these associations throughout her life. Having said that, usually when I'm in a room with people and I show them these paintings, they still make people blush. <laughs> these paintings have this power to remind us all about female anatomy, um, even if that's not what um, what Georgia O'Keeffe in intended. And I think she she uh, sort of stuck to that line throughout her, her long career, that that's not what these were necessarily about. Um, but even it, by the 1970s, you have uh, feminist art historians who are looking at her work in a new way, even if it's not about female anatomy, it is about female empowerment. So, um, so works like this, Jack in the Pulpit 4 from 1930, um, certainly helped to make Georgia O'Keeffe a, a, a fierce female artist. Our next artist is somebody that um, you may not have heard of. She's not in sort of the survey uh, texts of, of art history. And her name is Lee Miller. She was a female war correspondent who covered the US Army in Europe during World War II. And uh, she has this incredible life story. We're looking at two modeling pictures by her. She was, um, I think, born and raised in Poughkeepsie, New York. She moved to New York City as a teenager. And she has one of these classic success stories where she was about to cross the street, almost got hit by a cab. Somebody saves her. Who is it? Condé Nast. And, you know, a few days later, she's modeling for Vogue. <laughs> so she, um, she was, she, you know, a, a lot of fortunate connections in her lifetime. She um, became friends with leading photographers like Edward Steichen. Um, and she decided that she was really interested in surrealism. And so she actually moved to uh, Paris in the late 1920s and started working with the artist Man Ray. And she created this photograph that you see here on the left um, that's just called Bent Nude Forward. This probably isn't her own body. And I should mention that many artists at the time were creating images that looked like this, um, a, a sort of um, fragmented or distorted images of the female body, but Lee Miller's uh, take on this is not overtly sexual. It's just, I would say, just kind of disorienting. Uh, and then the artist Man Ray actually used Lee Miller's, a photograph of Lee Miller's eyeball in this kind of sculptural um, take on the metronome that he created called Indestructible Object. So she's kind of rubbing elbows with all sorts of interesting people and um, and leaders in the art world. And then World War II breaks out and she's in London at the time and she decides to stay and document um, as much of the war as she can. So um, she becomes a photojournalist. Many of her images were published in Life magazine. And she also teamed up with the American photographer, Ed, uh, David Sherman for a number of these um, sort of uh, expeditions. 
these her images are really remarkable. I love this image on the left. It's uh, it's called an exhaust an exhausted nurse at the 44th Evacuation Hospital, Normandy, France, 1944. This photograph was taken a month after D-Day. There were 40 nurses attached to this mobile unit. They were about eight miles away from Omaha Beach. And um, in the month after the invasion, they treated 4,500 soldiers and only 50 of them died. So when you look at this nurse, I mean, you're really looking at, at a real hero here. And then you've got to love the image on the right too. It's children celebrating the liberation of France in 1944. It's just, it's absolutely joyous. It's a, a, just a wonderful image. But uh, Lee Miller got in the thick of everything. <laughs> she wasn't afraid to document um, really sort of tough images like the image on the left, which is um, a, a dead SS guard in a canal. The image on the right is a bombed chapel from 1940. So she wanted to she wanted to document these things as historical evidence for what was happening in Europe. And she actually got permission to go to the concentration camps as well. So this is her image. She visited several of them in 1945. This is her image from, I believe, from Dachau. And I, it's just, it, it stuns me every time I look at it because the conditions are so horrific. And it, you can only imagine what these men were thinking when this beautiful female photographer walks in to this bunk and takes a picture of them. So, um, so here she is uh, sort of seeing the worst of the worst of what was happening in the war. And shortly after she took this picture, she actually um, traveled to Munich and she took this picture. In this case, she's the subject, not the photographer. It was her partner, David Sherman, who took this photo. She is sitting in Hitler's bathtub in this picture. And it's a very staged picture. Of course, Hitler probably didn't have a photograph of himself at the edge of his tub. Probably didn't necessarily have like little pieces of, um, of sculpture there, but she, you know, these were the boots that were just at the concentration camps. She's uh, disrobed, she's in his tub. There's that hose that's coming down behind her, which almost suggests kind of a, a noose there. So this becomes a very sort of famous photograph that she's associated with. But I think just for her, um, her courage to, to be in Europe during World War II, to travel to the places that she went to, and to her determination to, to document it, I think really speaks to her fierceness as an artist. The next artist we're going to look at is one that many people are familiar with now. She's sort of all the rage these days, Frida Kahlo, the Mexican artist. Um, she was, as many people know, severely injured in a trolley accident at a, at a very young age, at, at the age of 18. And um, it broke multiple bones all over her body. And she was in severe physical pain for most of her life. She endured, I think, 30 surgeries over um, the, the course of her rather short life. So, um, so what we see here is, is her lying in bed, creating a painting. And she most oftentimes she did have to paint in this way because she was in such sort of horrific physical pain. So her images, her paintings have um, sometimes been compared to sort of Van Gogh's paintings in the sense that Van Gogh's self-portraits could sort of show his emotional pain and Frida Kahlo could really show her physical and emotional pain in her pictures. This is called Broken Column from 1946. And here she's showing us, you know, um, the, the, the fact that her, her spine has broken. Uh, we've got the pins and nails throughout uh, the picture on her skin as though, you know, the, the very surface of her flesh is in pain. We've got tears pouring down her, her face and she's wearing this brace. Even the landscape here is cracked and broken. So she, um, she tells us in kind of horrific detail just how she's feeling in a picture like this. And she does it in many images. Sorry that this picture is a little bit grainy. It's called The Tree of Hope Remains Strong. And here she's, she's um, giving two different versions of herself. We see her on a hospital gurney um, after a surgery. Her, her flesh is bleeding and cut. 
And then there's another version of herself on the right wearing sort of a traditional Mexican dress, um, carrying a brace and a flag that says remain strong. Again, we have this kind of broken cracked landscape that echoes um, the pain of her body there. Frida Kahlo is sometimes associated with surrealism for images like this. Um, this is such a bizarre picture, the wounded deer that has her face on it. Um, so we see this really sort of um, grim forest landscape. There's not a lot of leaves in this forest. We see sort of broken branches and, and tree trunks with uh, these kind of knots and holes in them. The one uh, branch with leaves on it is broken here at the ground, uh, which again sort of suggests uh, the brokenness of, of Frida's body. And she painted this after um, a surgery that she just endured that did not go as she had hoped. So she shows herself here as this hunted, wounded deer who seems to be sort of splayed out on, on the floor of this, of, of this kind of dark and dismal forest. The last image that I wanted to show you by Frida Kahlo is a really interesting one. It's called The Dream of the Bed from 1940. And if you're familiar with Mexican culture, you probably have some sense that, um, that they treat the dead and their, their thoughts of death in a very different way than we do in the US. So they have the day of the dead where it's like connecting with, with dead relatives. Um, and what we do know is that Frida did sleep in a bed that had a skeleton on top of it. Um, acceptance and familiarity with death as being a part of life. But in this picture, her bed is floating in the sky. So it's, it's kind of a dreamscape. And that skeleton on top of her bed is wired with dynamite. Like death could happen at any moment. Death is ever present and, and it's an ever present threat. But here she is lying just below death in her own bed. And there's these green vines growing up and, uh, and across her bedspread and onto her, um, seeming to kind of sustain her and kind of keep her alive. So there is, um, a sense of hope in a picture like this, certainly not the same cracked landscape that we'd seen before. So, so this is Frida and she's definitely fierce for her willingness to, to document and show and share the pain that she would endure during her lifetime. So the last few artists that we're going to look at um, may not be as well known to everybody as, as some of the first few. And so this artist that is up here on the screen is Elizabeth Catlett. And she was an African-American and Mexican artist who worked primarily in America and is probably best known for her, her prints, her lithography prints. And she said that she, the purpose of her work was to present Black people in their beauty and their dignity um, for themselves, for, for ourselves, she said, and for others to understand and enjoy. And so for her, that meant working in, um, in realism. And she said that was the most meaningful to show, to really like document the struggle of African Americans. And so what we're looking at here is an unbelievably beautiful linoleum cut print of, uh, of, of an African-American woman, and we're sort of looking up at her. Just the perspective here creates a sense of awe. If you're not really familiar with how an artist would create something like this, imagine having a wooden block in front of you and every place, um, and, and all of these little lines are, are kind of cut lines. Um, then you would pour ink in that and then press paper onto that wooden block and then to take the paper away. So you can make multiples of this, but um, it requires a real sort of talent and precision in order to get an image that looks like this. And then what if I tell you that the name of this picture is called Sharecropper? So what we're looking at here is a woman who is stuck in a cycle of debt that she will never be able to get out of and that she has to do, uh, engage in, you know, really tough physical labor of, of working this farm. And, and all of a sudden, uh, the dignity that, that was already imbued in her sort of uh, it, it, um, 
it compounds itself and you have a real sense that that she is a, a really really strong person in terms of not just her character but her physical strength here so elizabeth catlett was creating these incredible images this one is called harriet tubman or just Harriet from 1975. Um, and so what we see here is Harriet Tubman as a conductor for the Underground Railroad, leading people away from slavery to their own freedom um, in a, a, a very, very dangerous act of, of, um, of, of leaving plantations, of leaving slavery. And so Harriet is sort of larger than life here. We know that they were probably moving under the cover of darkness, but there's light all around her to accentuate her as a leader and that, uh, that, gesture, that strong gesture leading forward. Um, and then this is probably the rifle of her gun right here at her waist. Again, you don't oftentimes see women of action or um, women that have the potential for violence in, in the history of art. And here we know just what a tough person Harriet Tubman was. And the detail here of the, of the woman with, with the baby in her arms always gets me because I can only imagine how terrifying these flights were that they were on and how scary it would be to have the noise of a child with you as you're as you're fleeing for your life. So um, just a few other images by Elizabeth Catlett. She wasn't afraid to address um, the present day dangers that African Americans faced. The image on, on the left is called uh, A Special Fear for My Loved Ones from 1946. And then the image on the right is called the Civil Rights Congress from 1950. And so both of these images reference lynchings. Um, they reference sort of the, uh, the, the menacing specter of the KKK um, and just the, the physical danger that African-Americans faced at that time. And, um, and, and so there's a, a sense of real bravery for addressing this in, in such a, a powerful way. Elizabeth Catlett worked in a number of, uh, of different media. And so what we have here is an example of a bronze sculpture that she did. This is in the collection of the Smithsonian. And the subject here, although you sort of get the sense that this could almost be in any woman, the subject here is Phyllis Wheatley. And Phyllis Wheatley was a young woman who was um, stolen from Africa, brought to America, and at a very young age, she was, you know, learning Latin and writing poetry. And so she, um, I, I think by the age of 12, she had, had um, uh, mastered Greek and Latin. And, um, and by the age of 14, she was, uh, she was writing poetry. She had met George Washington. She was this considered to be this really outstanding young woman. This is the image of her that was um, included in her book of poetry that she wrote in the 1700s. And so, you have Elizabeth Catlett in the 1970s referencing that pose and the strength and the brilliance of this young woman, um, but sort of translating, you know, the, the kind of uh, colonial bonnet that we see on the left to kind of a beanie that, that you would see in the, in the 1970s. So she does become this kind of every woman type character, um, but still honoring this incredible, um, this incredible history that, that she has contributed to. So, so Elizabeth Catlett, for all of these reasons, definitely qualifies as a fierce female artist. We're going to wrap up with Maya Lin. This is the only artist we're looking at today, tonight who is still alive today. <laughs> and uh, most of us are probably familiar with her because she was the architectural designer uh, who created the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial. So, and I love this picture here because she was a very young woman when, the, when, she, when this design was chosen. She was actually only 21 years old. She was a senior at Yale and she won this competition. It was a blind competition in 1981 to create this war memorial. And when it was revealed that it was a young Chinese American woman, who had created this, um, there was a backlash against her. Actually, the former presidential candidate, Ross Perot, called her an egg roll when he found out that it was a Chinese-American girl who had created this. Um, 
So, but, uh, but of course she went on to create it. And in 2007, it was ranked the um, 10th on the list of America's favorite architecture by the American Institute of Architects. So the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial in Washington, DC, most of us have probably experienced it in person at some point. It's dramatically different from the other war memorials in Washington, which we think of as, you know, white marble and celebratory and, and, the Vietnam War Memorial is, um, it's, it's, it's dark granite and, and it's carved into the landscape. It's, it's not a celebration in the same way. It's really um, a memorial in the true sense of the word. So what we're looking at here uh, is just um, one section of the 246 um, uh, panels that, uh, that document the names of the nearly 60,000 uh, veterans that were killed or soldiers that were killed in Vietnam. And it, the, the, uh, the stone here is highly polished as you can see. So, um, so everybody who goes has this sense of reflection literally <laughs> when they're there. Uh, one, and it's in the shape of a V, one, one arm of the memorial stretches towards the Washington Monument, the other towards the Lincoln Memorial. So when you go there, you can have this incredibly personal experience. You can go and, and literally touch the name of somebody who might have touched your life or of somebody who was maybe related to you. And you can even take a rubbing of their name and take that home with you. This is a very different experience than virtually any other war memorial that had ever been created um, in America. And of course it was, um, re it received a, a, a fair amount of controversy when it was created, but, but today I think people really appreciate it because it is somber and, and it seems to reflect um, sort of the American spirit towards this war in particular in a really profound way. Very quickly, one other um, site that she created a similar memorial for was the Civil Rights Memorial for the Southern Poverty Law Center down in Montgomery, Alabama. And this one has water flowing over the, the highly polished black granite with the Martin Luther uh, Jr. quote on the wall there. And, um, and then right beside this boy, there's like this round timeline of um, the, the civil rights era. So again, you can physically connect with these major moments from the history of civil rights. Uh, Maya Lin received the, um, the National Medal of Arts in 2009 from President Obama. Uh, I, I, I'm certain that she still has wonderful things in store for us <laughs> as, as an artist. But just to wrap up, looking ahead, thinking about what the Guerrilla Girls had said before, you're seeing less than half of the picture without the vision of women artists and artists of color. So I think they're still our conscience today. And they say things like being angry is a great place to start. <laughs> so, um, so just thinking about um, how do we how do we see more work by female artists by women artists and uh, what can we do? Well, the outlook is sort of mixed. It's really interesting. It's our last slide for tonight. <laughs> uh, the New York Times recently reported that women haven't made that much progress um, getting their work in museums, but then you have places like the Baltimore Museum of Art where they pledged for this year to exclusively collect work by female artists. So I think in whatever realm uh, you're interested in, whether it's the arts or nonprofit or, or libraries, what have you, to be thinking about the contributions of women in, uh, in a more focused way, uh, I think is helpful to us as a society in general. But let's wrap up there for now. Thank you everybody for your sustained attention. <laughs> and I welcome any questions or comments anybody might have at this point. Feel free to unmute yourself. I'll look at the chats too. All right. I know I covered a lot tonight. <laughs> that was a whirlwind. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. For Thank you so much, Jane. That was really excellent. Um, I think. Oh, wait, there's some. Uh, where can we find the recordings of art? On, oh, OK, I will submit that. I'll put that up on the website for the Chelmsford Libraries account. 
and also give it over to the um, Chelmsford Telemedia station so they can put it up on their website and show it over um, uh, over the um, broadcast television. Okay. And then I think, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, yes, Jen, that was it covered an immense amount of information. Thank you so much. Maybe people will have questions for you after they watch the recording of it, after sure, they watch sure. it um, next time. So don't forget that um, Janie's going to be back in October um, covering Edward Hopper, and that's on October 20th, I believe. And uh, then after that, we'll have Heroes and Heroism in November, just in time for Thanksgiving. And then in uh, December, we'll cover Vincent Van Gogh, which is going to be a great one for the holiday season, too. So, All right. Thank you so much, Jane. Right. It was wonderful. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Feel free to get in touch after the fact. If, if anything comes up, um, you can go to my website or Facebook page. So thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Have a good night.